Hey everybody, Dave Lindbergh in Hong Kong with another episode of the THC podcast. Today we have uh, somebody from Finland joining us, Miko Suvanto, and he's got a deep history in MEMS microphone and he's also written a book on the topic. So we're going to introduce him and find out a bit about his history and what makes him an expert on MEMS microphones. But before we forget, thanks to our sponsor, the Alti Association. They're going to have a meeting suite at CES coming up in January. And uh, I've been calling it a buffet of embedded audio technologies. So there will be some MEMS microphones and MEMS speaker vendors there, as well as myself and a few other, a bunch of other people, in fact. Uh, so it'll be a hot meeting. So please make sure to check that out at the coming CES. But without delay, we've got uh, Simon in Japan again. Uh, good afternoon, Simon. Good afternoon, Dave. All right. Good to see you. And uh, yes, Mr. Miko Suvanto from Finland. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Okay. So yeah, as I as I prefaced, you've got a background in MEMS. And uh, so you were with Nokia uh, building mobile phones, I guess, uh, for 10 years. And then following that with Acoustica Bosch. And Bosch is a, a big MEMS company as well, as we all know. And then following that... Yeah. 2016, so six years plus now, been running a consultancy for mini microphones for both the manufacturing side and then the buyer slash user side. So I, I guess for people, maybe give an introduction to yourself and maybe kick off with some education and some work experience on some maybe some products you've worked on and uh, kind of give us some some a table as to 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 what makes you an expert in MEMS microphone. Okay, sure. So yeah, my name is Mikko Suvanto and uh, I, I live in Finland. Uh, I've been uh, doing doing microphones basically for the whole whole career I have uh, behind me. So I, I uh, started at Nokia uh, uh, in in '98 and I, I was there as a summer trainee. In the beginning, uh, I was studying at the University of Technology in Tampere in Finland, and uh, and the Nokia office was uh, just across the street, so it was an easy transition to go there, and and uh, kind of an obvious choice for for somebody studying uh, electrical engineering and electronics like myself. And uh, and um, in 2001, I I uh, finished my studies. I did my master's thesis for Nokia on directional microphones for mobile phones. And uh, and then uh, after graduation, I, I started my, my work uh, properly in in the in the company wide uh, so called platform microphone team. So Nokia had this uh, system that uh, there were these centralized teams that uh, that supplied microphones to all or practically all Nokia products. Mm -hmm. So so that meant that uh, I during my my about. Uh, Ten years in the microphone team, I I supplied microphones to, or I was a central part of supplying microphones to about a hundred uh, Nokia phones, and uh, that means about three billion microphones uh, went through the team when when I was there. Wow. So obviously that that makes it a, a really nice place to learn about microphones and, and, and audio. And and would and, you uh, would have Nokia got to the scale where you were manufacturing your own designs of of microphones or? Or where were you at? And these were electric microphones still at this time, or, or what was the the time scale and the technology? When I started, it was all electric condenser microphones, and um, we didn't um, make our own microphones, but uh, but we designed or or, or uh, defined them ourselves. Okay. So um, so we we had specific needs um, for for the form factor and, and the, the uh, performance and, and so on. And, and then we work with the best suppliers available to to make those components happen. And, and then, then we'd use them in in the phones. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so that was basically the, the mode of operation we had. OK. And uh, yeah, so so sorry, I cut you off there. But uh, and, and then how did the progression happen from electrics? and through your work experience into the MEMS field? Well, MEMS started to come into picture between maybe 2003 and, and 2005. Okay. Um, but uh, we weren't the quickest companies to, to start using them because there were still 
uh, problems with them. The performance wasn't necessarily what we wanted it to be, and and the reliability um, maybe not either. And we also had this uh, multi-sourcing policy where we wanted to have multiple sources for components in case of uh, any any problems uh, and uh, and for supply safety and and of course pricing. If, if you have competition, the prices tend to be much more attractive. Mm-hmm. So it took us a while to to take uh, MEMS component in, into use. And uh, actually, maybe one thing that uh, many people don't know is that we, we actually had these um, reflowable ECMs, these rectangular ECMs, uh, before we started using MEMS microphones. And they, these were these uh, three by four by one millimeter parts. And... Uh, and um, <clears throat> so, so those uh, were used first. And uh, but, but the the big problem with those is that uh, when you put a a, a regular microphone, non MEMS microphone, to reflow, the the sensitivity will change. And uh, while while the change is quite predictable, it still uh, it it uh, it uh, causes uh, the accuracy of the of the component to to become uh, worse. So, so that was one of the the reasons why we wanted to go to MEMS. And uh, is that is that and, the heat, heat would be deforming part of the the pickup uh, membrane in the in the microphone? Is that the issue? Uh, the biggest issue in electric microphones is that you have this uh, permanent electric charge in the component, <clears throat> and when you put that component through uh, a reflow process then a, a certain part of the charge will will dissipate and and uh, mm-hmm. like i said it's uh, fairly predictable but uh, but still it's a source of uh, inaccuracy so so that's the biggest reason okay, yeah. okay. when um, when mims uh, first came into the picture uh, was there uh, some skepticism about it uh, as a technology or was it sort of more a case of waiting until it got good enough did people recognize that it would become the dominant uh, technology I think we did recognize it from from early on, but uh, but uh, when when Nokia, Nokia was basically the biggest microphone buyer in the world at the time, and and when when you have uh, volumes like that, then you tend to be uh, fairly conservative in in yeah. terms of uh, reliability and and supply safety and and things like that. So um, that uh, that kind of uh, kept us from going into MEMS early on. But I, I think uh, the the potential of the technology was was there from the beginning. Mm. But then then a funny thing is that the actually the first uh, MEMS component we used was uh, was um, <clears throat> the component by by Sonian, the the Danish company. Mm. And uh, and um, even though I I just said that uh, we wanted to have second sources uh, for our components, it was a one-off component, and and there were no second sources and uh, and. Uh, and uh, basically, it uh, didn't end up well. <laughs> mm. So, so our first trial with MEMS was was not uh, not a great success. But uh, but uh, so so there were some reliability problems with the components, and uh, they were later on fixed. But uh, but uh, when we tried to use them in in production, there there were still uh, kind of these uh, small issues that. Uh, caused potential problems uh in in certain circumstances so and so that didn't end up well and uh, but i would say that or uh, on a on a really large scale the the introduction of or, or the use of mems at nokia started only after i had already left in in 2011 mm. so so it took a quite a long time to mm. to and- to happen and just curiosity in the in the market deployment, was it Knowles and Sunyan that were the first players, or was there someone else that that failed that tried and failed in the MEMS category, or maybe got acquired? Um, well, the first ones were Knowles and and Acoustica was there also. Okay, with with the monolithic MEMS components. <clears throat> um. But um, and and then then of course later on, in in roughly two thousand six, seven, eight, we we were talking to all all the players that were out there. So NXP was still uh, around with, with microphones and uh, and of course Knowles and uh, 
and uh, and there were other companies also doing their best to to uh, come up with the components. ADI, for example, whose legacy now now lives on in uh, in in the components of, of TDK inventions. Mm. Yeah, it's always always kind of interesting the the migration of these companies and how they they ebb and flow and some just catch a wave and succeed and others get uh, it, bad timing. I mean, uh, I guess if if it wasn't if it was two thousand three two thousand six trying to pitch Knowles on a MEMS, they were listening but they weren't quite buying yet and so uh, it's, right it's interesting. All right, actually I, I did a kind of a small lecture on, on the history of MEMS microphones uh, for the Royal University of Technology of Stockholm. And, and you can find it on YouTube if you're interested in, in having a maybe a slightly deeper look okay. into the history of MEMS from my point of view. Sure, yeah, we can put the link in the description for people. Sure, yeah. Well, I'm curious about this. I'm curious about um, uh <clears throat> The advantages of MEMS uh, compared to electric microphones, and um, it seems to be more a case of uh, uh, the way you can implement it rather than the acoustic performance. Is that fair to say? In the beginning, yes. So one of the biggest uh, reliability problems there was with uh, with the electric components was that they were not uh, reflowable, and and therefore the electrical connection. Basically, there, there were two options, either wires or springs, and and uh, mm. and uh, wires are, are not uh, not conducive to to high efficiency uh, mass manufacturing. What mm. what Nokia was basically known for. So so we we used the springs in in all of the ECM systems, and uh, and we didn't use just the just the metal components. We we had uh, some plastics around them to. To house the the microphone itself, and and also to to include the springs in in the so-called module, and uh, and those springs, even though they were gold plated and and uh, everything was done that could be done to to make sure they are reliable in the long run, even even if uh, they they the, the coatings on on the springs get uh, get uh, rubbed off a little bit and and so on, but still they they. Were a reliability concern and uh, and also they were not as as easily uh, assemblable as as uh, something you, you can you can do with a pick and place machine. So yep. so those were probably the biggest reasons. Um, performance was also uh, a, a reason to go to MEMS. Not not in the beginning, like I said, the the performances of MEMS components were, weren't necessarily better than, than ECMs, but, uh, but there was a clear uh, path to improvement on the MEMS side, whereas uh, ECMs um, found it harder to, to, to find ways to, to improve the performance, mainly SNR. Yeah, so by that stage, it's kind of the technology is at its limit, is it? For, for the electric, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, how about low frequency performance? Was that not an important issue for phones? Um, especially in the early 2000s, that wasn't really a big problem. Um, back then, phones were mostly used for, for talking. Of course, <laughs> uh, video cameras were already <clears throat> starting to pop up in, in phones and, and, uh, and Nokia was was at, at the forefront of the development of of the of the video side and and, and the picture side so so later on especially uh, we got complaints from the phone people that uh, our cameras are getting better and better but uh, the microphones are not so and and that, that was especially related to to high sound pressure level recording so for example in a in a pop concert or something yeah. you could have a really nice picture quality already Back in in two thousand and five, or, or something, somewhere over there, but uh, but uh, the the microphones tended to distort quite easily and and overload quite easily. So so that's when when the acoustic overload point uh, um, term got uh, introduced, yeah. uh, and uh, and then we, we started developing these systems, uh, which enabled us to go up to one hundred and forty. 
uh, DBSPL. We, uh, with in, in a so. MEMS microphone or in another trip microphone? Or both? Uh, both. Yeah, okay. Oh, wow. yeah. Is it a simpler task for the MEMS microphone? You just physically have a uh, larger uh, space to move a diaphragm in? Um, well, back when we, we started tackling this problem, um, the microphone technologies themselves, either ECMs or MEMS, they, they were not able to to handle this problem by just improving the components. So, so we came up with a, a few pieces of uh, IP um, where we basically divided the sound pressure level scale to two sections and, and uh, we used the normal microphone uh, properties in, in the normal sound pressure level scale, but then when, when it went up uh, beyond 120 dB or 115 dB SPL, then we would switch to another channel which had a, a lower sensitivity. And that was actually really successful. Not, uh, not cheap, uh, but, but uh, the sound quality in, in some of the later Nokia uh, flagship phones like uh, the 1020 and uh, 920, I think are, are at least two examples that they were magnificent. And uh, maybe, maybe nowadays uh, phones are, are reaching something similar already, but, uh, but um, we, uh, were, we were pretty successful with that. Is, is that something they continue to do with, with uh, phones? Is microphone diversity like that? Is that, is that a common practice to this day? Uh, no. As far as I know, the, the Nokia system, the one we came up with, is, is not in use anymore. So now, now the components themselves have, have improved so much that, uh, mm. that uh, uh, companies are, are reaching 130, 135 dB SPL. Yeah. Uh, and, and even going beyond that uh, yeah, with the spoke... maximum sound pressure. Yeah. So we have maybe not on the SPL level, but we have spoken to some people that are talking about using dual mic for uh, for stereo recording from a mobile phone. Right. So that, right. yeah. So that might be a different different results, but uh, still with mic diversity. And, yeah. and just so, so people understand a bit more about the, the manufacturing process of a MEMS versus an electret, is, is there advantages to the consistency of the MEMS nowadays? And that translates to, to good performance in, in mobile devices and everywhere we put mics. Is that one of the benefits that we're seeing? Definitely, yeah. So, so uh, you can imagine that if you create an acoustic sensor based on, on uh, plastic spacers and uh, plastic foils and, and uh, sputtering some coating on the, on the membrane and, and so on, you're going to end up with a stack of uh, tolerances that's much wider than, or, or much higher than, than you would get in, in a ve very well-controlled uh, semiconductor process that you use to manufacture a MEM sensor. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely a factor that also. Yeah, and I, I suppose the sheer demand of the, the MEMS has, has driven the cost right out of them was compared to where it was in the early 2000s as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. The, yeah, the manufacturing process leads to that. Um, okay. So the, yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the MEMS microphones generally regard as having a, a, an excellent flat response across its main operational range, whereas an electret tends not to. It will have some other, uh, a bit of a bump depending on its diameter. Is that a thing? Yeah. Uh, well, it depends a lot on, on, on the way the, even the MEMS component is, is designed, but, uh, um, the frequency response wasn't necessarily uh, the biggest one of the biggest factors why why MEMS took over at least uh, as as I see it. Okay, um, um, uh, just on that point, uh, uh, frame it slightly differently. So the a MEMS microphone actually operates completely below its fundamental resonance of its diaphragm. So they have some resonance at like twenty k, sixteen k, or something, and right. then uh, below that range, it can be a range that there's no resonance. You get essentially a flat response until you uh, roll off. But a MEMS microphone is not; it doesn't operate. It, its uh, diaphragm resonance is not that high, so it does land somewhere in your operational range. Is that a fair understanding? In a MEMS microphone. In a, in an electric microphone, I should say. Electric microphone. Um, well, in in a typical case, especially talking about mobile phones, you you cannot put the microphone uh, on on the surface of the of the device, so. 
you have to have a small hole through which sound enters the yep. uh, the sound channel and and then the microphone and uh, and in a typical case the the acoustical implementation or integration of the component to the device is a, is a bigger limiting factor to the to yeah. the frequency bandwidth that you get than than mm. the component itself so i w- i would say that um, typical electric components were good enough so yeah okay um Okay. okay. Yeah. So the, whatever resonance that it does have is uh, heavily damped by the acoustic fluid anyway. So it's kind of irrelevant, and these other factors uh, overwhelm that. It's kind of yeah. So the, the one of the biggest uh, things there is the free is the um, Helmholtz resonance. Mm-hmm. So um, so the channeling uh, and and the cavities in the channel they they will cause a resonance, an acoustic resonance that then uh, causes the the. Uh, frequency response of the system to to spike up and and then fall down and and basically that spike is is the, the factor that uh, limits the the bandwidth in yep. most cases. So in in the early days when when I started in in the Nokia microphone team back then phones were pretty much used only for for speech and uh, and uh, some of the the microphone module designs. Uh, uh, that we we had, they they caused the resonance to be somewhere around seven eight kilohertz or something like that. So so the bandwidth was was very limited, but uh, but it was fine because the the uh, bandwidth of the phone system was was uh, between about three and a half or three hundred and fifty hertz and and uh, three point something kilohertz. So. Yeah, yeah. So that was fine, but of course, then then when uh, more sophisticated uh, systems, uh, uh, communication systems came about and uh, and uh, enabled having eight kilohertz bandwidth and so on, then then of course the the phones had to improve also. Can I ask you something about this? Actually, um, so you just mentioned the three hundred to three k kind of standard telephone, old fashioned telephone range. Um, right. uh, I have this impression that somehow that got uh, converted into some people's understanding that that is the optimal frequency range you should use for voice communication. So that is to say, if you could have any frequency response you wanted and the application is voice communication, you should cut off below 300 and above 3K in order to optimize it. But there's a misunderstanding of where the 300 to 3K comes from, is it? Yeah, yeah, that, that's definitely a misunderstanding. Um uh, that that uh, legacy telephony bandwidth enables you to have a pretty well understandable speech, and <clears throat> it enables you to recognize who's talking. So the important frequencies are in- included. But uh, especially nowadays, when when you want to have natural uh, sounding speech, you should definitely go at least down to two hundred hertz, or rather down to one hundred hertz. Mm. And and maybe up to eight kilohertz uh, on on the upper end of the of the frequency spectrum to have a, a natural speech yeah. uh, uh, per- perception of speech and and also I believe most uh, speech algorithms and and uh, and uh, uh, systems that uh, process speech they they operate up to eight kilohertz also. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this 303k is an absolute minimum. It's not an idea of this all. Well, uh, maybe not an absolute minimum. So you can still squeeze it down, but but then yeah. then your your uh, the rate of of uh, speech understanding will go down, and and uh, you may lose, for example, the ability to recognize who's who's talking because you you're losing the key frequencies or some of the key frequencies for that. Was that so? Was that established by a limiting technology at one point in history? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't even know exactly what it was, but it was related to to the electrical yeah. systems that uh, that then transmitted the yeah that's, the audio. That's, that's interesting. There's a lot of things in audio and music that have been historically created because of a limitation or a hum or a buzz that happens at a frequency. So, anyways, let's put that aside. So. This uh, this expertise has translated into now your business as a consultant. So your core business is to be 
to to helping people design and manufacturing MEMS, or, or tell us a bit more about what your your business is at this point. Yeah, so maybe maybe I could go back a little bit then and uh, talk about Acoustica also. So um, okay, uh, at the end of two thousand eleven. Um, Nokia was kind of uh, not doing that well anymore, and and I had been doing the same thing uh, uh, more, more or less for uh, about ten years, and and then Acoustica got in contact with me, and and I decided that uh, it would be a good chance to see what's on the other side of the table. So so I, I moved from Finland to to Pittsburgh, yeah. and uh, and uh, took my family there, and uh, and uh, I was there for about five years, and I, I was. Uh, my main main job was to be the the kind of the one man product in, product innovation team, uh, meaning that uh, my my job was to uh, define the products uh, on a three to five year scale uh, to see sort of uh, the market and customer requirements and and uh, and make sure we have the right components to to uh, answer to those needs and uh, and that of course being on the manufacturer side was a great opportunity to learn about how. Basically, what happens behind the curtains when, when, when you design and and manufacture MEMS microphones? So that was another factor that helped me yeah. uh, in the process of of writing this book uh, to to know what what happens uh, happens on on the supplier side. So so basically, I've then been in in my own business that I started uh, in two thousand and sixteen when I returned back to Finland. Uh, um, I've been, my, my customers have been uh, microphone manufacturers who who uh, uh, needed maybe marketing help, uh, document creation and uh, market research and uh, and uh, kind of technical marketing stuff. Mm-hmm. And then on the other side, the, the customers who buy the microphones and uh, and to them or, or with them, I've, I've done uh, product uh, integration and um, optimization of uh, speech ui systems and uh, and things like that and uh, help with help uh, help them with the uh, component selection to make sure they have the right microphones for what they need and and so on so that's that's the core of of, uh, of my own business at mosomic so so if somebody came to you whether it's a uh, like a smart speaker or a anc headphone or a mobile phone is there a product category that obviously mobile phones is probably your expertise but Maybe correct me on that. Is it is a universal to is something you know about like all applications of MEMS? Is this you can help anybody that's trying to integrate MEMS? I would say I can help pretty much everybody. Of course, um, uh, I may not know know exactly what what happens in their system uh, electrically, but uh, but what comes to the the integration of the microphone uh, mechanically and acoustically and and also also electrically i can i can assist there and and make sure that they they have the right capabilities with the components to do what they they want to do in terms of for example uh, microphone arrays uh, and uh, speech recognition and and so on okay is there any kind of marquee projects that you're allowed to mention or we keep that off the record um uh, we should probably keep that off the record okay pretty much right. all customers say say that uh, i'm not allowed to to mention them so very good but you're, you're here in front of everybody so anybody can contact you now and and get the expertise so well, this- well actually actually we should uh r- right now talk uh, about that in in the past tense because uh I started uh, working at the Bosch Sensatec uh, at the beginning oh. of uh, January. So uh, the microphone or, or my own consulting business, Mosomic, is pretty much on the back burner now. Uh. The only thing I'm doing is is uh, selling the book and, and taking care of, of that side. But uh, otherwise, my time is uh, fully occupied by by other stuff. Okay. Okay. Very very good. That's fair. So then let's let's talk about the book and what. What just give us like a high level view of what people will learn from reading the book, and just just give us an overview, please. Um, well, I I could maybe say a few words uh, first about how how the book uh, came about. So, so when I started my my consulting thing, um, one of my my sort of challenges is that I'm, I'm not a sales guy and I needed to find a way to to market myself and uh, and uh, and find customers and then help uh, customers find me and 
And my my solution to that was to create this uh, video series about MEMS microphones on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that uh, <clears throat> between 2019 and, and 20. And um, basically, it's 28 videos, about uh, nine hours of, uh, of material about MEMS microphones. And, uh, and uh, then uh, in, the, in early 2020, um, I, I was pretty much done with that project. And I was uh, already, I had uh, several projects uh, lined up with customers to do uh, the stuff that, uh, that I was talking about, uh, mainly with microphone manufacturers to do uh, possibly video productions for them and, uh, and uh, marketing materials and, and things like that. But uh, then, of course, as we know, COVID happened and, uh, and suddenly those uh, projects were cancelled and uh, I had a significant amount of free time on my hands. And uh, I thought, OK, I now have this, uh, these scripts from the videos and uh, I'll just uh, turn them into a book. And I thought that it's going to be a quick and easy process uh to just uh, put them in on paper and uh, and uh, release it but uh, that's not uh, what happened eventually so mm. so the project just grew and and grew and uh, it ended up taking a year and a half to to finish the book and uh, and uh, but that, as a result uh, there's about two and a half times more more content in the book than in the videos so so i, I did uh, create uh, a lot of new stuff just for for the book Okay, and the uh, so, so the, sorry, the yeah. audience the audience for the book would be manufacturers and integrators, um, people using microphones in their products. These are all the kind of the target audience for for the book. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, my my thought about the book was to make it uh, as approachable as possible. So so you don't need to know hardly anything about microphones or audio and acoustics uh, in order to start uh, um, reading the book and, and uh, understanding it. And, and uh, for that reason, for example, I, I included this quite lengthy uh, chapter in the beginning about sound and acoustics just to make sure that uh, everybody reading the book can, can then understand what's uh, said in, in, the, in the chapters later on where I talk about the uh, acoustics and uh, implementation and, and uh, things like yeah. that so I, I saw the i saw the uh, the the glossary of the um abbreviations so the acronyms <laughs> which uh, which i love is because in manufacturing there's such a diverse number whether it's materials or acoustics or electric electrical engineering what does that acronym mean so i, I really enjoyed just just my nerdy part is like oh all the, like a nice glossary of all the acronyms at the beginning <laughs> of the book it's very nice um right yeah that's really good and and where is it is available on Amazon or where where are people going to pick up the book direct from? Your um, I I'm afraid it's not available on Amazon. So so right now I've outsourced the the selling of the book to a, a chain of record stores here in Finland called okay. Record Store Record Store X or Record Shop X, Never okay. Cup X in in Finnish, and uh, and they they handle the the selling globally. So okay. If you, if we there's somebody the interested, uh, yeah, we can put the links in, in, in the description. Okay. All right. That's, that's really interesting stuff. Uh, it's quite the little journey and it's uh, quite fascinating on just to hear what somebody had done during COVID. Uh, Cause actually Simon and I making these, this podcast was because of COVID. So it's, uh, right. yeah. It's, so we're in the same boat. It's brought can, us together. Can you give us a bit more uh, brief synopsis of what topics you cover? Uh, sure. Obviously, yeah. MEMS microphones, <laughs> you know, to lay it down from there. Yeah. So uh, to to uh, say a bit, a few more words about the, who the book is for. So yeah. even though it's it's understandable for for most people or, or people also to people who are not uh, that familiar with audio and acoustics and microphones, it still goes quite quite deep into into stuff. So so. I'm I'm convinced that there's a lot lot for even seasoned uh, microphone people and and uh, acoustics people to learn. Mm. Maybe not about uh, audio and acoustics, but but about uh, the integration and implementation of components into devices and uh, and reliability requirements and and uh, 
testing of uh, electrical testing and, and electrical acoustic testing and, and reliability testing and, and so on. So so it, it does go pretty deep uh, into into these topics. And uh, of course, I, I talk about MEMS microphones a lot also. So what are the building blocks of the of the components? And uh, so the ASIC, the, the MEMS sensor and, and the package mm -hmm. and uh, the, the structure of the microphone, of a typical microphone and, and different kinds of microphones and, uh, and also um, acoustics in, inside a microphone, uh, then also related to the system that the microphone goes into. So, so that's then, of course, related to the integration of the component into, into, into a device and uh, and of course, I, I explain all the uh, performance indicators in, in depth. So what, what you have, uh, sensitivity, frequency response, SNR, distortion, current consumption, RF immunity, and, and so on. Mm. So, so uh, a big portion of the book is, is about those. And, uh, and I also do some deep dives, like, for example, how, how phase affects a microphone system and and what you need to take into account and how the component affects that and i also uh, one of the so called interludes that i included uh, was was about uh, the relationship of uh, noise and uh, and signal in a system so what affects both and and how you end up with the signal to noise ratio that you eventually get out of the the system mm. and but uh, i would say that uh, some of the key in my eyes, some of the key content in the book is the the stuff about integration or implementation of, of uh, microphones into devices, so electrically, acoustically, and uh, and uh, mechanically. So so there's a lot of stuff about that, and uh, I think that can be very useful for people who are integrating microphones in, into their devices. Very useful. Yeah, I guess sometimes you might see it too, but quite often uh, uh, some product builders will treat a microphone like they would any other electronic component and say, well, I stuck it on the board, so it should just work, right? But no, yeah. there's a bit more to it in terms of how you actually get the uh, sound into that microphone. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, and in, in the book, I, I also added a few things, a few topics that I, I didn't uh, include in, in the in the videos uh, that I made. So, so I talk about, for example, MEMS components versus ECMs, like we discussed uh, early in this pod podcast. And, uh, and also I compare MEMS microphones to what I call normal scale microphones. So, so things like this. And, uh, and basically I compare the performance and, and the things you, you should uh, take into account when, when, uh, using MEMS microphones and and especially if you're if you're thinking about uh, replacing large scale microphones with these miniature components like MEMS microphones so what are the key things there and uh, I also have a have a chapter about directional microphones and uh, and uh, basics of directional arrays so when people design arrays I think it helps them if they have have the basics at least mm. covered so they understand uh, what happens there and, and then they understand also better when 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 they need to form more complex arrays mm. and wind noise mitigation is also one one other topic i i cover in the book Ooh, that's a big topic too yeah. uh, that's a yeah. big issue i think uh bosch sensor tech uh i know some stuff they're working on that <laughs> quite heavily but uh, we won't disclose anything here um yeah yeah okay so simon any more questions uh one one more point um uh uh, how do you see the future for MEMS microphones? Is the technology getting to its limit or is there quite a lot of scope left? Um, there the seems to be a lot of room for improvement. So we have at least two companies out there talking about ADD BS and our microphones, which is a huge step up from, from the components you see in, in devices like smartphones or anything else nowadays. So now... now Normal microphones are in, in higher end devices. They're somewhere between 65 and 70 dB SNR. Um, some of them going about 70 dB also. But now, now, sensible the the startup in Norway and uh, and oh yeah, in, in in Finian, not so much a startup anymore. They're they're both uh, talking about 80 dB in in their 
when, when they talk about the future and uh, then we we start to approach the question or we are already at the question whether it makes sense for for the device to to have addb snr can 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 you benefit about that or of the performance of the microphone anymore so mm. um basically we can say that with that kind of uh, performance numbers mems microphones are very close to to these big microphones that cost uh, mm. this one cost about 200 euros and uh, if a MEMS microphone costs one euro, a really high-end one or two euros, then we're talking about similar performance with the one hundredth of the cost. So yeah. that yeah. can uh, disrupt quite quite a few uh, fields of, of audio industry in in the future, and, and I, I really look forward to that. Mm, of course, uh, the the volumes that you produce then maybe may not be so so high, but uh, but I think the the revenue available there could be still uh, attractive enough uh, to even to mass manufacturing companies like uh, like Bosch or or Infineon mm -hmm. to to go into that uh, that those markets okay we'll all right that's a it's a good introduction to you Miko that's uh, um so let's let's table this for today um encourage everybody we'll put the link for the the book to go source it out below and uh and the videos and everything we talked about today so we uh we encourage everybody to go check that out and of course like subscribe share hit the notification bell and uh we'll see everybody next time thanks again thanks bye bye